Joining me is Dr Cassandra Goldie, the Chief Executive at the Australian Council of Social Service. Uh, Cassandra Goldie, thanks as always for your time. We spoke to you earlier in the week. You're very critical of the decision regarding JobSeeker. Now you can see the broader picture of the numbers. Does it change your view at all? Well, no, it really affirms, Karen, why we've got to get that job seeker payment at something which is adequate and permanent um, to make sure that the millions of people who are either already unemployed or very worried that it's going to be them, you know, in the days, weeks or months ahead, have that kind of security. Look, you know, the picture that government has painted today is one that's really confronting and hard news uh, for everybody. It's particularly harsh news for people who are already uh, unable to get work, locked out of paid work, very worried about where that job will come from. So I want to acknowledge how important and applaud the government for the big action that it took back in introducing JobKeeper at the time and the doubling of JobSeeker. Um, both of those measures were crucial in protecting jobs. You know, what was it said about 700,000 jobs that it was estimated were saved? 700,000 people's lives were better as a result of that. And of course, that doubling of JobSeeker, same with 1.6 million people who right now at least have their head above water. So, Kieran, look, you know, we've seen the the best the government could present us today in terms of where we're at. Clearly, we're in a stronger position than many other countries. Um, we need now further bold visionary action to respond to the scale of the health and economic crisis that is being presented to us. And 9.25%, that's the forecast peak for the unemployment rate, but there are many, including Warren Hogan, the economist who I spoke to earlier, my colleague Andrew Clennell, among many others, who think that is very optimistic to think that it would peak at that. Look, I, we think that's right as well. Um, I think it's so important that we don't try and paste over or mask the scale of the human crisis, the reality that, you know, if people are um, being locked out of paid work for a range of different reasons, we see that that is happening, that we make sure that we have the supports in, play, in place for people that when it is happening to them. And we also have a determined plan to create jobs as quickly and safely as we can. So I want to touch on that because there was some speculation again today about those stage two tax cuts. Um, we didn't get an announcement today. That was very welcome from our point of view. We're going to say to the government again, we urge you to rethink uh, introducing personal income tax cuts. That's not what the country needs, Kieran. That, that stage two would cost about $16 billion. With the scale of the unemployment situation that we are presented with, whether it's the 9.25 per cent, we, as you say, we predict it's going to be deeper and harder than that, um, you know, particularly if we don't do much more than is currently planned by the government. Uh, we're going to need every dollar spent to be... We can guarantee it's going to create jobs. So we've put forward things like the big investment in social housing and proposals around mm. investing in care services. The government's done some of that. That's reflected in the budget papers today, investment in aged care. Gee, wouldn't that be something you'd go is a real priority right now? Let's make sure that the dollars that the government invests next are guaranteed to either protect people's incomes who need it or create jobs, not $16 billion going to people who have jobs on higher incomes. Most of those dollars would be going to the top 10% of income earners. And I just really want urge the government and everybody to have a say on this one. Um, that's not the right decision for us to be, you know, again, going down a tax cut path at this time. Okay. And just uh, finally, before you go, Cassandra Goldie, what, what's your advice on the government's position when it comes to mutual obligation? It's going to return within the next month or so for those on unemployment benefits. Obviously, in Melbourne and, and broader Victoria, but Melbourne particularly, there's going to have to be some flexibility with government agencies on that. Look, we've, we've urged the government, to, of course, to um, hold off on introducing sort of obligations around job search, you know, a sense that somehow if you're not out looking for jobs, you could risk being cut off from income support. Now, what the government's proposing um, is nowhere near what it could have been. Um, it's, it's very modest. But the concern for us now is the psychological effect of this. I think everybody's acknowledging that we've got a huge mental health risk 
for uh, the community. You know, we need people to feel as as calm and, and and addressing the anxiety of people as we can. We would be saying to the government now, given the scale of the level of unemployment, the fact that we've got one job available for every 13 people who are looking for work, provide a helping hand, offer support, check with people, like a welfare check. How are you going? What do you need? That's what people need right now, not a notion of somehow, gee, you know, if you don't do the right thing, we're going to potentially take you off income support. That's not what we need. It's unrealistic. And I think at the moment, a tone which is kind, which is understanding that this is a crisis that is affecting people very badly is what we need. And so we'll continue to talk to the government about that. Um, I think there's a few other things that they announced in the last couple of days which are welcome like they're going to continue to uh, not have wait periods for getting on income support that's great they are pr planning to bring yeah. back this thing called the liquid asset test Karen which you may be familiar with it means you, you've got to wait for income support if you've got over five thousand dollars in your bank we're saying they abolished that we shouldn't be requiring people to draw down to have virtually nothing behind you before you get access to income support. I was on a call this morning mm. with a lot of the charity organisations. They're very worried with the scale of financial distress, particularly, again, that psychological effect if you've got nothing. So we're going to urge yeah. the government to stick the course on something like that. Um, we're, we've got to really make sure that um, we're working on every level to protect people and to help create jobs. Dr. Cass Goldie, as always, appreciate it. CEO of ACOS. We'll talk to you soon.